No, it's it's good, Shay, because then I'll take the recording and put it up on our meetup and stuff. As long as I get the royalties. That's fine. <laughs> not not a problem. We'll charge people to watch it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, everybody, welcome and thank you very much for inviting me to this. I I do appreciate it. Um, as Stephen sort of alluded to, I come from the operations side of the world. Um, I have about a hundred decades of experience. Uh, starting in mainframe computer operations in the United States Marine Corps about 500 years ago. And uh, back then I started with equipment that was uh, pretty ancient. The Marine Corps was um, had a, a pride point that it always returned some of its budget every year back to uh, the government, never used all of its budget. So as a consequence, we always had substandard equipment, including mainframe equipment that was 15 and 20 years old. Uh, when I started in the Marine Corps. So my experience predates almost my own uh, lifespan in terms of technology. Um, I grew outside of the mainframe world into Unix systems administration and moved throughout um, Unix sysadmin, network engineer, network architect, systems architecture, uh, security penetration testing, uh, security architecture, um, databases, and storage architecture. So I've kind of spanned a lot of the physical infrastructure stack and uh, was also for a while I uh, worked at Symantec as uh, um, infrastructure architect for Symantec's uh, OpenStack cloud platform, uh, cloud platform engineering uh, department. I was the founding uh, technical architect for that department and we built a 8,000 node uh, OpenStack cluster across uh, four data centers and uh, I got bored with that and went to a startup called ZeroStack doing more OpenStack stuff and got bored with that and landed at Racken, which um, I've really been enjoying uh, because it's focused primarily on the foundational building blocks of infrastructure. And oh, there you are. I get to see all of you I'm eating pizza. I'm jealous. Well, I, do you guys have beer? I got beer. You can't have a meetup without beer. You know that, right? Well, I don't know. Southern Idaho, a lot of you guys are fairly conservative down there. <laughs> oh, we got beer. We're going to break out the bourbon here. <laughs> All right. Good. Excellent. Um, so uh, so I, I've been really enjoying my ride at, at Rackin now because it really brings together a lot of my experience in um, sort of infrastructure and expertise and skill and passion, which is important in a job. And um, I really love the ability to be able to bring automation. Uh, I'm not supposed to say, say orchestration, uh, and I'll explain why in a bit, but we bring automation and orchestration to the world of provisioning, and we've modernized uh, provisioning service. For those of you worried, this is not a vendor pitch. Um, there is clearly a company behind uh, Digital Rebar, but Digital Rebar itself is an open source core. Uh, fully functional provisioning service. So if you want to play just with the open source pieces and have a functional modern API driven uh, provisioning service, you absolutely can do that. Uh, otherwise, we're happy to engage in a commercial engagement with you and take all of your company's uh, war chests uh, as much as humanly possible so we can all become rich and famous one day. Um, oh wait, I wasn't supposed to say that either. <laughs> Uh, for those of you interested, uh, Digital Rebar, our website for the, the open source product is rebar.digital, which has sort of been scrolling there in the background. And today I was going to talk to you. Oh, let me um, lay a little groundwork for you. Um, I, I like interactive engagement with people. So if you have questions as we move through uh, the conversation tonight, um, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, it's a little bit harder when we're doing uh, remote presentations like this. But I do very much uh, uh, enjoy having interaction with people I'm talking to. And so if you have questions or if I'm just talking rubbish and you want some clarification, um, please fire away, um, raise your hand, jump up and down, yell at me or something so to get my attention. Um, I very much um, am fine with interaction and questions as we go. Um, what I was going to talk to you a little bit about today um, is sort of the last mile in, in data center and infrastructure. And it, it's something that has been sorely lacking in most modern tooling for managing infrastructure. And that's sort of the automation of the metal, the bare metal itself, 
and making uh, bare metal provisioning services uh, zero touch and making it as simple as deploying a VM or a container and in something like an OpenStack and AWS, Azure, GCE, Kubernetes, whatever. And that's one of the, the fundamental cornerstone principles for digital rebar is let's make metal automation as easy as virtualized infrastructure devs um, and operators have in managing those environments. And so keep that in mind as we go through, because I think it's um, something that has been lacking in most of all the tooling that exists out there. Um, we covered a little bit about myself, um, but digital uh, rebar comes itself comes from um, a fairly strong background, starting with our founders um, who came from Dell, uh, Rob Hirschfeld and Greg Altman and Victor Lowther. Um, they were um, charged uh, by Michael Dell at Dell to deploy huge data centers, massive scale data centers um, w for Dell's customers. And there were no tools that handled that at scale. Um, there are a lot of tools out there and, and some of you, I, I don't know all of your backgrounds, but presumably you guys are interested in infrastructure since you're here at this, this meetup. Um, either that or for the free pizza, but um, either way, it's all good. Um, that there was a challenge that they kept trying to deploy application stacks in Dell's customer environments and they kept seeing the same patterns over and over and over again and every time they would have to rewrite from scratch to meet those same generic patterns and from that was born a, a solution that was originally designed as an OpenStack installer and it was called Crowbar and Crowbar was designed to be a flexible provisioning tool for a very complex beast uh, named OpenStack, which some of you are probably familiar with, and if some of you have tried deploying it, it's not an easy solution to deploy. And so Crowbar tried to solve that problem and then quickly grew beyond just OpenStack deployments as they realized they had a good tool there. And um, then there was sort of a next generation, Dell decided to open source uh, Crowbar and it became Open Crowbar. And there was a rewrite of the platform as it went out to the open source community and a reworking of it and a lot more, you know, outside influence came into making it a gener generalized uh, scalable provisioning service. But ultimately, there were a lot of lessons learned and a lot of technical debt accrued in building that platform that the guys said, well, hey, wait a minute, we know we can do this better. We want to go do this better, build our own company around this. And the first generation of digital rebar was born, which ironically we call digital rebar version two. Um, and Digital Rebar version two was this big, huge suite of um, containerized solution that did this very complex application orchestration for bare metal provisioning to a full application installation. And uh, we quickly found that there's some fundamental flaws with the concept of trying to enforce application configuration uh, on top of your bare metal automation. And the biggest hurdle was that day two, when you handed the whole mess over to the team that now has to run and operate it, they have no clue how it works. They have no way to introspect and in how it was configured. They have no applications that are designed to manage that through the way it was built and provisioned. And so a, a big rethink came about about a year ago and we sat down and we pretty much threw everything away and started from scratch with a much cleaner, sharper focus of bare metal provisioning. And let's just focus on one single machine, one single asset, and let's perfect that. Let's not focus on an entire application suite that's a huge, complex, monstrous beast. Let's do that bare metal uh, OS install and provisioning and do it really, really well. And that's kind of the focus for digital rebar provision uh, version three. We often refer to it as DRP or digital rebar provision. We try to differentiate from the older version of the product. Um, make no mistake though, we didn't throw away a lot of the, all of the code. Um, we took 
a lot of the, the good code from the earlier version of uh, digital rebar version two and a lot of the concepts and sharpened them and honed them and um, just made them much better. Um, that basic concept of making things um, simple and easy has been a stratospheric leap um, for what digital rebar can do. Um, too many people um, focus on this, this concept of sort of a, a single pane of glass. Everybody wants a tool that does everything for them. And consequently, consequently you end up with the same old problem of a um, um, jack of all, master of none. And that's the problem with a lot of these single pane of glass solutions. Um, so digital rebar is very focused. It's designed to make operations consist, uh, uh, to solve the problem of inconsistent operations and manual heterogeneous environment um, builds. Um, and one of the things that we also found moving forward is we're now able to apply the concepts of immutable infrastructure, which I'll talk about the definition and what that really means in the bare metal world in, in a moment but we can apply the concepts of immutable infrastructure to bare metal provisioning, which is a very exciting change, uh, we think, in the provisioning space. So let's talk, that's sort of a lot of sort of backstory and background. Let's talk a little bit more about sort of the details of what um, digital rebar is. I mean, essentially it's, it's fast, it's an open source, simple, and it's 100% API driven provisioning service. Coming with that, you have your sort of basic um, provisioning things that you must always have. I mean, this is sort of one of those basic laws you just can't get away with from. You need a DHCP service. You need a PIXD service. You need a TFTP service. Uh, we lay a HTTP server over the TFTP tree to support IPIXI capabilities. Uh, we've added a very strong, uh, very uh, complex, or not complex, but cohesive API. Uh, we hope it's not complex. It's actually the antithesis of our intention is simplicity. Uh, we also support bin L, but nobody really cares about that. So we won't talk about it too much. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, that's digital rebar. That's it. Did you guys enjoy your pizza? Any <laughs> questions? All right. We'll turn a couple hours back to you guys and go home. At the... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's really not it. There's a lot more to it. I mean, we take the, the basics uh, of provisioning, those basic building uh, blocks that we need to have in place that most provisioning services have already. So if we look at the, sort of the bottom of the stack, we have our, our provisioning tools. We might have Foreman, we might have Cobbler, we might have Mass uh, from Canonical, we might have Razor, we might have Ironic, we might have, there's a, a huge jumbled pile of tools that sit at this bottom layer. Essentially, the reality is we displace them. Throw them away. You don't need them. They're all ancient. Most of them are architected and designed in the 90s uh, to early 2000s. None of them have significantly changed. Um, and there are very little modernization that's occurred in most of any of those tools. Um, it's one of the things that we feel that we've really brought to the table is modernizing provisioning services. Sitting above that, you have tools that do your control layer um, for managing the control of your provisioning services. And again, that's a canonicals mass, metal as a service. VMware has a whole suite of tools around those. Uh, there are things like Terraform. There are things, there are a number of tools that sort of try and give you control on top of your provisioning services. But at the end of the day, they kind of fail to do that. Um, Sitting on top of that, you're going to have your orchestration tools, things like uh, Terraform kind of straddles control and or orchestration. So it, it should sort of sit in both uh, uh, levels. Uh, but, but you might have things like Ansible, SaltStack, Puppet, Chef. You might have Bosch. You might have some homemade Perl scripts. You might have something from a vendor that promises you a panacea of orchestration perfection in your environment. There's a pile of things that sit in that sort of environment. Um, but layered on top of that is the stuff that sort of matters, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's getting bits on, on the machines that humans, people, application services interact with. It's the platform that does something for us. And that might be OpenStack, it might be Kubernetes, it might be any number of things. The problem is there's been this rift 
between this control and provisioning world and orchestrate and platform world that none of the tools really cleanly uh, addresses. And that integration gap hit, kind of exists there. I, I mentioned briefly that Terraform tries to sort of straddle that. Um, they don't do a very good job of it, in my opinion, and they're fairly weak on the control side. They're more oriented towards orchestration. Um, where we come in, where um, Digital Rebar comes in, is we combine that provisioning and that control, and we provide that integration up into the orchestration and platform side of things. <clears throat> and how we do that is by allowing you to dy dynamically determine in your journey from bare metal to something useful, so from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack, where do you want to stop with your provisioning activities? In our old product, we were very prescriptive. We went all the way up to the platform. We got you Kubernetes. We got you OpenStack. We got you whatever your application or clustered services were that your real workloads ran on. And again, that problem was that next day integration, that next day tooling, that next day operational and management of the environment. Being prescriptive, it doesn't fit a company's way of doing business. So by decoupling um, all of these steps and giving you the control to decide where you want to stop provisioning, how complex do you want to get in the provisioning life cycle of a machine, you can control fairly easily where to stop with our tool and where you pick up with your tool. And that journey might be as simple as just give me a bloody CentOS machine, stock, that's all I want, I will do everything else from here. All the way to give me a CentOS machine with, uh, I need some SSH keys in there because I'm an Ansible shop and I want my SSH keys there for managing it. Oh, by the way, I want you know Ansible installed on these machines and oh, by the way, I want these packages installed as a baseline, stop there. Or you might wanna go further and say, okay, Install all of these applications, install Salt Ma uh, Master, a Salt Minion, configure the, the keys, public and private keys for the, that environment, because I'm going to use day two. I'm going to use Salt to manage my infrastructure, my environment. I want you to bootstrap my Salt environment. And I want you to slap Kubernetes on there for me, and then I'm going to take over. So we give you that sort of ability to fairly easily define within the workflow of a provisioning a single machine, where to start, where to stop, and where to hand off, and integrate with those handoff tools. Uh, with that sort of background, what are some of the things that um, allows us to do that? Um, oops, I have an extra slide in there. Uh-oh, that was the spoiler alert. Sorry, you gotta see the pre-built slide, pre-built slide. We're doing slide editing on the fly. Ho, ho, ho. Okay. You forget everything you just saw for a moment. Um, some of the components that, that we do, that we use to manage infrastructure and provisioning is you usually start with sort of a management platform. That might be an administrator's laptop. It's going to be a jump host. It's going to be a bastion node, it's whatever. Um, we start with that basic platform and we connect and orchestrate and manage uh, digital rebar provisioning the service itself. And from that provisioning service, we define uh, our configuration of our Windows, our Linux, our bare metal, our integration uh, hooks with some of the other bare metal service providers like packet.net. We love packet.net, um, by the way, at, at Racken. They're a, a fantastic company that we use very heavily. Uh, if anyone's looking for a bare metal service provider, please talk to me about it. I'll, I'll go on and on and on about it. Um, we can do some uh, virtual machine orchestration as well. It's not our specific forte. And in fact, we'll tell you not to use us to do virtual machine orchestration. But realistically, within a DevOps CI/CD tooling workflow environment, we need to uh, do things like vir um, virtual box to be able to do testing and integration testing and stuff like that. So we have hooks to do virtual machines as well. Um, basically, your, o your standard OS provisioning aspects, but then on top of that, we provide, um, stepping away from digital rebar, the open source component, Rackn provides uh, add-on capabilities and enhancements where we provide automation libraries that you can pull in components from to do your provisioning and orchestration. 
It's important to note, though, that we know almost every big business air gaps their management environments or at least has very tight controls over the network access controls in and out of their management network. And as a consequence, digital rebar provision is designed at its core and foundation to be 100% air gapped and to never need internet access. Our automation library and our um, UX portal uh, is designed as a single page React application that's downloaded to that infrastructure management laptop, Bastion, uh, Jump Host, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and then the communication occurs from your infrastructure management point of view, um, your laptop or whatever your administrator uh, authenticates to and communicates with the provisioning service uh, inside your own firewalls and inside your own network. Very often, since those things are air gapped, the administrator will have to bring up a special VPN that gives them access to the management network. That is what allows, excuse me, that connectivity uh, to manage and orchestrate through the UX and that single page React application. Um, so I've thrown a lot at you or a fair bit at you so far. Um, any questions on that, comments? Anybody who's completely bored and wants to gracefully get up and sneak out the back door? Quick, Steven, lock the back door. <laughs> so no? All right. <laughs> it looks like uh, the most of digital rebar is really looking at that uh, bare metal uh, provisioning. Is that correct? Yeah, very much so. That's, that is our laser focus is bare metal, your infrastructure, and provisioning. Now, in today's world, we can't just build a product that only focuses on that. Our product is, is very carefully built to be able to integrate with other tools and other services such that we can either extend those tools or those uh, we can add the ability to integrate other tools with other things like AWS orchestration, GCE, Azure, uh, VMware clusters, whatever it is. And, and because we're 100% API driven, first and foremost, when we write a solution or a fix or an enhancement or a feature, it's implemented as an API first. Our CLI is dynamically generated from that API. We don't sit down and write the CLI and, and consume the API, which gives us the benefit that 100% of what you can do in the API, you can do in the CLI and they're structured to be very compatible with each other so that you can say um, um, boot M's list, it's gonna follow the API structure of boot M's list or boot M's show UUID is the same thing as DRP CLI boot M's show UUID on the CLI. They very much follow each other so that you can understand how the API works and the CLI works and they work in, in conjunction with each other. And that's an important distinction because almost every other tool we've ever seen out there starts either as a poor API that has a CLI that's kind of written to consume the API at best case. Um, the next thing you tend to see is it's a CLI tool that's written in Perl or Python or some other language. And then someone goes, oh my God, we need an API. Let's bolt an API on it. And some guys stick an API on the side and six months later, it's no longer relevant to the CLI or the CLI has changed and now it's broken and that's just the reality of most of those tools. And then they add a UI on top of that that drives the CLI. That's just backwards from how modern software is designed to work. And so digital rebar provision is designed to be API first, CLI um, is a first class citizen to the API and the UX is sort of the lowest class citizen to us where we implement the API um, features as we develop the UX. It, it's the piece that tends to lag behind in capabilities, not by a whole lot, um, but it does lag behind a little bit in capabilities. So um, yes, we focus on bare metal provisioning, but that integration allows us to work with other tools and Terraform, which um, was I think promised in the abstract for today's meetup, I'll, I'll mention briefly a little bit. We integrate with Terraform. So we're, there's a Terraform provider DRP plugin to Terraform that allows you to take Terraform, Terraform's DSL for 
driving infrastructure and extending that to bare metal. Terraform by nature was designed to do AWS, GCE, Azure, um, cloud services stuff. But we can now extend that DSL to allow you to manage bare metal infrastructure and a hybrid environment so that you can just as equally consume AWS resources as bare metal resources and Terraform is your interface to how to do that. It's your standard language to express your infrastructure. Uh, that's one example. Uh, so yes, we focus on bare metal, but we help you with the reality of today's world by being able to integrate smoothly. Does that probably over explains? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any follow on questions to that? Graphics are what, going yeah, sweet, sweet graphics. Cool. Uh, what is, <laughs> who is Rackend's ideal customer? I think I have you, an idea. You know, yeah, so really the only thing that differentiates or defines sort of an ideal customer for us is tends to be more on the side of scale. Uh, it tends to be a customer that has a lot of infrastructure that they need to manage and automation is critical to success. Um, you can absolutely take digital rebar provision and stand up a, a five or a 10 node lab and it's gonna work beautifully for you. It's gonna be easy to use. You're gonna love it. Um, it. It's simple. The UX is actually quite good. So anybody that's not you know, a CLI jockey or an API head is going to in, in have a good experience with it. But typically our customers are at scale and typically scale for us starts somewhere around a thousand or more nodes, uh, physical machines that need to be managed um, and, and that's sort of the scale that we do best at, at from a company uh, commercial perspective. Um, digital rebar provisioning as a service itself is quite capable of just managing one or two servers uh, or 10 servers or four racks of servers in your environment. We have a lot of people in our open source community that have relatively small scale deployments and they're perfectly fine to stick with the open source parts and the open source content that allows them to do basic provisioning uh, elements. Some of them would like some of our paid add-on capabilities, but at the end of the day, they don't really need it because they don't have that large infrastructure that they're trying to automate and orchestrate. Um, outside of that, our customers are pretty diverse um, from Fortune uh, 100 to enterprise to games to universities, game manufacturers to universities to, um, it really is a diverse, pretty much anybody that has physical infrastructure uh, we have as a customer in our portfolio uh, or we're engaged with to hopefully make them a customer. So from like uh, use cases from big analytics solutions, you know, a thousand nodes, Exactly. Yeah. So we wouldn't even blink at that. Um, yeah. And, and really, when you talk about a, a workload, we don't really care about workloads. Um, that's not our job. Our job is laser focused on provisioning lifecycle and getting you to that workload piece. Um, but we've done it, I believe, and, and I've been in, um, all kidding aside, I've been in the industry a, a really long time. I've been in uh, the professional industry of physical infrastructure uh, since 1991. Um, I have no idea. It's like 10 decades or something. I think I, I, I can't do, I can't count that high, but um, I've been in the infrastructure for a long time and um, I was really, really um, impressed with the thought and the experience and the operator first, nature of what digital rebar provision is because most of the tools out there just aren't designed to be managed or used at scale. And uh, provision is, is one of those tools that does it really well, I think. And it's a modern tool. I, I, obviously, you know, I, I have a, a bias. I work at Racken, um, but I didn't have to work at Racken. I had a lot of job offers when I was looking around again. And I really love what, what we do at um, digital rebar with digital rebar provision. Um, carrying on, otherwise we'll be here till midnight because in, in case you, you can't tell, I can pontificate endlessly. Um, but carrying on, 
Um, uh, digital rebar provides what we call sort of composable from visioning. We believe one of those things that, that we believe that makes digital rebar provision really good is it's designed by the, the, at the outset to give you lots of little composable building blocks. It's very much like a Lego set. You have those, lots of little blocks of different sizes and you can put them together in different ways to build different things. But the fundamental goal is to provide you lots of little reusable pieces that you can assemble to do something interesting with. And with that in, um, sort of back, in the back of our mind, um, we do that through sort of a, a set of tools or a community package that we release, which is the open source community package, looking at the, the right side of the screen uh, at the very bottom digital rebar community packages. Those are a, a set of content pieces that get you basic provisioning. Give me a CentOS, give me a, a, an Ubuntu, give me a Debian uh, a server, and I want um, a custom Kickstarter pre-seed and a set of packages. And I want to do some basic workflow to get the machine to a, a given state. Um, those pieces are designed to be reusable and they're templatized. So every piece of content we have, we use Golang templating so that we can um, at instantiate or at use, we instantiate the template and, and resolve the template and then use it. And so it becomes a very dynamic, flexible piece of, of content. And that base layer of content is locked read only so that you don't change the content. If you want to make a change to the content um, outside of the authoring tools that we have for content, you would clone content and make changes to it. And that gives you a fundamental um, ability to upgrade and update safely the content in your provisioning services so that when you replace content, you know you're not gonna blow away an operator's changes that are unique to that environment, but now they can have that upgraded content to work off of as a base. Um, layered on top of that, we have the rack end sort of commercial side of things, our uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, packages that allow some extended capabilities and features along with some plugins for integrations for bare metal um, hardware control, some things like that. And then as a consumer or, or an operator, you would layer on your uh, content on top of that. And this layered stack, you can choose uh, what you want to override as you go up the stack. You can choose to say, use all of this, but I want to change this one component uh, as a custom change to the environment or throw it all away and do your own stuff from scratch. You can do that as well. And, and we have the tools to do that. Um, within the provisioning server, you know, like I mentioned, we have the, the basic TFTP, HTTP, DHTP service capability, um, a REST API that sits on top of it. But we also use standard WebSocket events to emit uh, event information from the service. So you can subscribe from any application that can talk WebSockets, which is pretty broadly used to be able to uh, pull information from uh, the digital rebar provision about what's going on with its state and provisioning activity. And uh, in addition to that, we have plugins where you can emit data to out external logging sources like Elk Stack or Splunk, or uh, it's a very uh, uh, smooth plugin capability to extend uh, the ability to do additional interesting things. Um, Basically, uh, a provisioning service um, starts out and looks pretty much the same for us as anyone else. Uh, you start out with a, a rack of servers sort of in the middle there. Uh, they DHCP, Pixie to, to kickstart their um, uh, process for provisioning. Uh, a kickstart or a pre-seed is served back to the machine. Um, one of the things we do is we take our CLI, DRP CLI, and we actually embed that uh, in our discovery and our provisioning service uh, so that it talks back to the digital rebar provisioning endpoint service and orchestrates the, the workflow of the provisioning activities. So that is essentially it's an agent, but the benefit to that is you don't need SSH. So you don't have to bring up an SSH service, manage keys, and then worry about what you do with the SSH service and authentication and uh, access to that machine. This 
fits in line with a lot of immutable provisioning uh, concepts as well. Uh, because those systems are, uh, I'll, I guess I'll jump the gun a little bit here. Immutable provisioning for us means create and destroy pattern, which uh, is similar to virtual machines or containerized environments where you create an asset, you use it for a while, you throw it away, and now you create a new asset and, and re-implement that asset, redeploy that asset. Same thing with containers. That's sort of a mutable provisioning uh, uh, concept. We can take that and throw away a server and reprovision a server very quickly. And you don't need SSH to exist because most of the time those machines don't need operator intervention. They're black boxes. Uh, hence, we have a black box for server here. It's actually not accidental. <laughs> but um, uh, in addition to that, you know, traditional kickstart pre C package-based provisioning service, which is not an immutable pattern because if you do package-based deployments, you end up with some random uh, configuration server service at, at some different library that has some version that has some bug in it that you don't know about on some machine that is different from every other machine that was deployed three weeks ago because the versions have changed. So that's not a very immutable pattern. So we also support the ability to do image-based deployments where you can take a raw image or a DD image or a file system tarball and lay that down on the machine and you can guarantee uh, what is laid down on the machine is what you intended to be laid down on the machine in your cluster. Uh, at the end of the provisioning uh, activity, our um, agent is dissolvable, uh, which means it goes away, it goes poof. So you don't have to worry about a security vector of something laying around on the server post provisioning. Now, if you want, you can keep our agent around and there are some add-ons and benefits that you get to that in terms of um, larger lifecycle orchestration and management that you'd like, you might want to do. But the default um, capability or the default um, feature is to just dissolve and go away so we don't have a, a potential security vulnerability that we've injected a vector that we've injected in your infrastructure environment because of our provisioning activities. Um, just walking through, does, how many people want to walk through on TFTP Pixie provisioning? Uh, let me just go through the first half of this and then we'll see it from there. Um, some of the differentiators, uh, digital rebar provision itself is a single Golang binary, which is uh, makes it super lightweight and easy to deploy. Uh, it's less than 30 megabyte in size and it's almost completely standalone binary. There's almost zero external dependencies on it. That means we can embed on something like a, a Raspberry Pi with an ARM processor all the way up to great big huge hyper-converged infrastructure to some you know, $40,000 HCI server of some type. Um, so it gives us the ability to run on many different operating systems platforms from Mac OS to Linux platforms, 32-bit, 64-bit, uh, ARM, Intel, Windows, Windows 32-bit, Windows 64-bit. Uh, we can run on just about any platform uh, without any problems as long as Golang can cross-compile for it. Golang can cross-compile for just about anything out there today. Uh, so it's simple to deploy, it's lightweight to deploy, and it's 100% API um, uh, managed. Uh, through the REST API through 12-factor uh, design patterns. If any of you have, uh, haven't have seen 12-factor, uh, I think it's 12factor.com is the website. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, walkthrough about modern API application design. We very much adhere to those tenants. Um, and um, like I was saying, uh, we have some customers that are very interested in embedding and di digital rebar provision into the top of rack switch. So when they roll out hundreds and hundreds of switches, they can decentralize their provisioning services uh, and, and each rack can provision itself through the top of rack switch. You don't need separate infrastructure to be able to manage your provisioning service. This is also a very uh, interesting story in today's modern uh, Internet of Things and edge and fog computing environments where it's a huge decentralized environments where we might have a thousand uh, sites of anywhere from 10 to a few hundred servers, as opposed to 10 sites of a few five to 10,000 servers. So um, that allows us to very easily decentralize the configuration and management. 
um, we have our sort of traditional, uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, traditional uh, TFTP DHCP provisioning service with the HTTP support for IPIXI. Uh, so we manage that and, and that's all orchestrated uh, or organized, I should say. Uh, I should stay away from the orchestration phrase. Uh, through configuration data, which is a key value uh, store, it's a, not a relational database. So the key value store holds the configuration data by default, it'll be stored on file system with a digital rebar provision service, but we have plugins to allow you to store them in other key value store services. So if you are running a centralized uh, digital rebar provision servicing uh, environment where you might have one big server provisioning an entire data center, that's a model some customers use, you could use an external key value store for high availability purposes, something like uh, console from HashiCore or, or any other key value store, we can add a plugin to support uh, for the backend uh, configuration metadata. And then of course we have an API that sits over the top of that, um, uh, or API service that the digital rebar provision services as well. Um, going back to our sort of basic management slide, um, if we take a look at that and, and we blow out uh, the uh, left half of the screen, infrastructure management and on-prem, some of the things that we can provide uh, with Rackin is the, the sort of self-service portal, it's a UI or UX that provides you a relatively nice uh, ability to manage a huge number of distributed digital rebar provision endpoints. So if you have 100 DRP endpoints, we enable the ability to manage all of those cohesively from a, a single UI or UX. There's absolutely nothing that prevents you from being able to write your own tooling. Since we have a strong API, you can write your own tooling to manage your own uh, uh, provisioning endpoint services or work with any number of our partners that have already started integrating us into their solutions. And examples might be like OpsRamp or Device42 or some configuration management infrastructure as code service companies that are integrating us. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Stackstorm. Stackstorm does uh, event generated uh, auto remediation and healing uh, services of infrastructure based off of uh, events. And we've started an integration with them so that they can actually do provisioning activities or deprovisioning activities based on infrastructure events that happen in a very complex environment. So that API gives us a really strong ability to do integration across a number of different solutions and services. Um, obviously we provide support for digital rebar provision, that multi-site synchronization. Uh, we proctor and manage the community content packages as well as the rack and uh, advanced content packages. Uh, and this all sits and revolves around the open, di open source digital rebar component. And that's the open core to everything we do. Um, and then we do a lot of uh, down the stack, at the bottom of the stack, we have a lot of hardware integrations that we can do, uh, things like Dell, IDRAC, HP ILO, um, uh, Supermicro's BMC integration, or uh, if you're so unlucky as to have Supermicro hardware, um, um, and upstack platform integrations, things like uh, Kubernetes. We have integrations with Ansible. We're, we'll be working on integrations with SaltStack, Puppet, Chef, some of the common configuration management tools so you can actually instantiate and, and build your clusters and have your clusters ready to go with your configuration management tooling uh, plumbed in. Um, so we're sitting at uh, so Shane, can we, just under an hour here. Hey Shane, can we do a demo maybe? Yeah, um, we can. Um, okay. Yeah, why don't we do a demo so you can get an idea what it looks like? And uh, let me, yeah, looking like is going to mean the uh, yeah. UI. So, anything, but at least you can get an idea that this is a real thing. So, okay, uh, so uh, the first piece, what I, I just did, so this is a, the rack end portal, uh, which um, the first thing I authenticated against was my digital rebar provision endpoint which is hosted in packet.net. So packet.net is a bare metal service provider with data centers around the world. And um, I've authenticated to my machine, uh, my endpoint. So this is my DRP endpoint and it's um, referenced by the wonderful IP address 147.75.65.3, 
because I'm too lazy to create a DNS record for it. Um, but that is the endpoint we're looking at right here. So there's two components to the UI. There's the authentication to the endpoint itself. And then if you want access to the more advanced rack and capabilities and features within the UI, and this is purely optional, most of what you need to do from a provisioning perspective, you can do without um, authenticating secondary authentication to our portal. Uh, you can see on the left side, we have a couple of lock icons. These are the things you can't do uh, without logging in. Uh, a rack and portal account is free. It just allows us to track how people use um, the service and how um, we can better um, add um, features, capabilities, how things are used. So you, if, with your free account, you would log in. And so I log in with my free account here, and now this will unlock uh, overview bulk actions and workflow capabilities. Um, but essentially, we start out um, with a set of uh, general preferences related to the entire environment. And uh, our workflow is composed of what we call stages. So you define a workflow that is implemented as a series of stages chained together. And it's a flexible definition. You can choose to do A, B, C, and D. You could choose to do A, C, D. You could choose to do A and D only. You could do A, Z, Y, X, D, whatever you want, um, whatever those stages are. Now, obviously, there are certain constraints and you need to do some basic things like get an operating system in place first before you might do any post provisioning activities. But essentially, you can do anything you want. If we don't have a workflow defined, we have to define the defaults of what to do. The basic thing that almost every customer, no matter what, does is drop into what we call our discovery image, which is implemented based on our what we call our boot environment that's named Sledgehammer. Um, digital rebar, sledgehammer, scaffolding. If you're catching the drift, we have sort of a naming scheme going here. Um, but sledgehammer is our live boot in memory OS instance that allows us to do the advanced workflow pieces and manage the stage, uh, uh, stage transitions of workflow. And it enables us to do those really cool things. And so when the machine pixie boots, it pixie boots into this in, uh, in live boot RAM image of Sledgehammer, um, and then we can start the process of, of doing something more interesting. Um, what we're seeing here is some of my content is behind, and I need to do some upgrades. Uh, so we track content, we track upgrades, and we help you manage, uh, ensuring that you have up-to-date content if you want to manage that content. Um, let's see, what's, where do we want to start with? Um, let's start with content packages. So. Uh, a content package itself is just a big, huge blob of JSON or YAML that defines do something, do some things. And it's composed of the, the basic building blocks that we use for provisioning, which are things like parameters or variable bits of information, profiles. A profile is a uh, group of parameters that have some information related to them. So profiles allow us to group parameters. Templates define um, an actual provisioning component, something to do, but it's designed as a template. So an example is we have an example workload that is a Kubernetes uh, rebar immutable bootstrapping or crib, as we like to call it, or um, leerless feeder, uh, Rob likes to call um, our Kubernetes play crib. And so at the end of the day, it's a simple bash script that's a t templatized bash script. And by templatized, you can see that there's some Golang templating here. And dynamically, as a machine comes up and starts a process that includes this crib install shell template, it'll, uh, it'll fill in the templatized components dynamically on the fly. Um, so that, at the end of the day, is what does the real work. And some of the lower pieces of work are tasks. And a task is essentially a, a do something that calls a template that has parameters and profiles in it. And we have a job subsystem, which def is, uh, relates to all of the things that have been done. So we can take a look at 
the state of things and very quickly and easily bubble up what has happened uh, or what hasn't happened that we expected to happen. Um, and those are all part of workflow. Workflow at the end of the day is what's interesting because this is what does something. Now, this is a very simple demo system, so I don't have a lot that I'm demoing here, but basically um, I have Discover, which is my starting point. Um, when a machine comes online, we don't know anything about it necessarily. We may know something about it because if we're operating in an infrastructure as code environment with like device 42 or, or ops ramp, they might pre-fill out information and inject that into digital rebar provision and say, hey, by the way, you're gonna have these machines that come up online. But for the most part, most people, machines boot up and that's the first time anyone sees anything about them. So we discover that machine. And so it's where in the packet environment, packet is an API driven bare metal infrastructure service. So we leverage the packet API to do a discovery stage and say, hey, am I in a packet environment? And this is optional. I know I'm in a packet environment. So I added this. And so it does some helper stuff where it lets me talk to their metadata services and I can actually inject my SSH keys that I store in their metadata service. I can do other interesting things with it. I can do reboots and power cycles of the, their hardware through their API that we're driving through us. The next thing is I do a test of Ubuntu 16.04 install. And this is an interesting stage because it's actually a non-standard stage. I cloned it and called it test Ubuntu 16.04 install. Our default boot environment is Ubuntu 16.04 install. So I was playing with some customization changes. So this allows me to actually do the provisioning of my customized Ubuntu uh, distribution. And so we discover the machine, we do some API stuff with Packet, we install Ubuntu 16.04 on it with some pre-seed that's been defined. And then once Ubuntu 16.04 has been installed, um, we actually want to inject those SSH keys from the packet environment so I can SSH into the machine and manage it with my keys. So this stage then does that interaction with the metadata service, pulls the keys down and injects those for my users. And then once I'm done, I'm complete, don't wait. That means dissolve the, the agent and walk away, job done. So that's sort of a, a very brief introduction to, to a workflow element. And all of that is implemented where we started our journey. Uh, I did warn you, I, I can be sort of verbose sometimes, but I, I do try and get back on track. <laughs> um, getting back to the content, we can look at what community content is and we can see, we can look at a preview of the content. And so by default, we try and make it a little easier to digest up front at first. Um, but what we can see being reflected here is we have seven boot environments. That's an operating system install definition, CentOS, Ubuntu, Debian, et cetera. We have 17 parameters or 17 variables that can be reused in our content that define flexible information. We have one profile, which is rolls up multiple parameters into one profile that we can apply to a machine or a group of machine, machines. There's 13 stages. So the stages are what we saw in the workflow. So we have 13 flexible stage units that you can assemble. <clears throat> All of those things have seven tasks that, <clears throat> excuse me, that do something and 14 template files. So now we can see that there's some parts to them. And if we expand the boot environments, we see you have CentOS 7 install. And from there, we can take a look at the content um, and we are in the process of playing with our pretty print and colorification stuff. So it's not terribly good right now. I apologize for that, but we're working on that in the UX. Um, but essentially this is just JSON that defines the CentOS 7 environment that has some important things like in the default um, community content, we're gonna do an install off of the mirrors by, by first grabbing uh, the CentOS 7 minimal ISO. We explode the ISO out, rip out the Pixie provisioning pieces and parts we need with the init RD and the uh, um, init RAM uh, FS pieces to do the Pixie provisioning against. And then we use those components for provisioning. And so there's a bunch of other information that goes with this. 
things like the uh, machine's MAC address that we, we are gonna need for relating to provisioning. Um, but what's also important is CentOS 7 Kickstart template. <clears throat> this is one of those templates that we're gonna use within the boot environment that defines the actual operating system configuration that gets put in place. When it gets run, it's gonna be called compute.ks or kickstart. And that will be served via our HTTP service for a customized URL for this specific machine. So it's dynamically generated for this machine uh, and it has a unique path in the API structure and is called compute.ks. And so this is a very important piece because this is what gets served to the, the CentOS 7 install uh, to do the actual work. <clears throat> if you wanted to, you could see what the content looks like, which we haven't obviously gotten pretty print wrapped around this, but essentially this is one great, big, huge, enormous, eye-crossing, mind-numbing, boring blob of JSON where all of these pieces are rolled up into one, one content pack. So that allows us to manage a group of content that has a whole bunch of small pieces and parts. Now, we can look at what is actually in our endpoint, which is on our, our center panel there, the endpoint content, and stuff that I haven't installed is in the right that's available to install. And so I can simply come over here and say, Terraform, I wanna install the Terraform piece. So I click on transfer, now I have the Terraform piece installed, and we can see that it's composed of several of these same components that create, um, the information we need to do Terraform related stuff within a digital rebar provision cluster. And again, we can look at the full mind numbing eye crossing uh, JSON that is what makes Terraform work for us. Um, that's content. Um, I mentioned briefly that we put download like the CentOS 7 ISO. So we can see that these are the ISOs on this uh, endpoint that have actually been downloaded. Uh, and installed in the digital rebar provision endpoint are now available to service provisioning activities. Um, we have a number of plugins that you can uh, install, for example, packet IPMI, uh, which we talked about in the workflow. Uh, this is, allows us to do the hardware um, power on off recycle activities. Uh, we can install a similar virtual box one for managing your virtual box local VMs through provisioning activities for test and, and uh, dev. Um, in addition to that, um, I, I'm looking right now in my personal library, which just doesn't have an entitlement to the larger set of um, additional things. Um, but if I were looking at a larger entitlement, you'd see a, a list of more things that can be installed here. An example is Slack integration to be able to do uh, emit met provisioning activity messages to a Slack channel for uh, watching activity as it happens in your infrastructure through Slack if you should be a, uh, someone who uses Slack. That's an example integration. Um, general provisioning services require uh, DHCP leases um, and those leases can be converted to reservations so that a machine uh, can receive a, a, a an IP address that is well known or standardized in your environment doesn't change all the time, essentially a static IP address through DHCP static ass assignment. Um, I don't actually have any leases here because in the um, uh, packet.net environment, they have their own Pixie services and, and we actually proxy the DHCP services through their environment to through a, a Pixie chaining to be able to do the uh, install provisioning service. So we don't actually manage the lease for the machines in, in that environment. <clears throat> if we were managing machines in, in an environment, we would generate a subnet declaration which re relates to the DHCP environments that we do provisioning activities for. One of the really nice things that we can do is we can literally just turn on and off provisioning activities. We could have 100 subnets in here and we can toggle them on or off dynamically depending on you know, safety requirements in an environment. We do a provision in an environment and we wanna go away we don't want to do any incidental or accidental provisioning and just disable the subnet. Um, uh, as we can see, I have one 
plugin install, which is the packet um, plugin that allows me through my API key to be able to interact with the metadata service and authenticate the packets API. Uh, and we do safely obfuscate the API key because I don't want you guys using my API key and I don't want to get a great big huge bill from you guys playing around in packet.net environment. Um, and so it's important to be able to obfuscate information. Um, we only have one machine that's provisioned in this environment. Uh, it's called packet five min node ZWR101. Uh, it has an IP address that was assigned of this. It was installed as a CentOS 7 uh, boot environment uh, through the CentOS 7 install stage. But if we had 100 machines here, we could simply select all and we could say uh, change this to Ubuntu 16.04 and make it runnable. Um, I can't do that right now because there are some other requirements I have to satisfy, but it would be that simple for, for changing. Uh, boot environments for machines. You can reprovision a bunch of machines that quickly. Um, and again, a representation of a machine um, has its own uh, representation and state of things that we can do. I can pixie, set it to pixie provision. I can set it to boot from disk. I can reboot it. I can power it off. I can power it on. Um, this is all sort of metadata that's related to the, the machine. This is actually just JSON in the back end. We haven't added to the UI. Uh, show raw JSON, but the CLI lets us do, do that. So we would literally just do DRP uh, CLI machines show and then UUID of the machine. And we would see the JSON blob that relates to the this machine's representation in the environment. So uh, yeah. Any questions or no, I got one question. Uh, what about um, managing SDNs? You guys uh, set up the subnets for, you know, sets of things for uh, availability zones. Um, so that's something that would be done with a larger, uh, more complex plugin. Right. Since we don't focus on virtualized environments or cloud environments, um, we don't have any specific tooling uh, to do API or control and um, command and control activities for other hypervisor virtualized environment in environments. Well, Should you want to I mean, go ahead? Presumably, presumably a lot of this bare metal has got more than one niche. Or maybe yeah, absolutely. So, so through bare metal, we would do that um, through content, uh, which would be a, a, essentially it would be uh, most likely someone to structure that as a stage and you would create a stage that does network specific configurations and you would be able to define multiple network configuration scenarios with flexible um, Golang templating pieces that would say do these sorts of things, create a bond uh, across these four gig ethernet ports for these two 10 by uh, gig ports and then I want uh, to set up uh, VLAN tagging for VLANs 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 on this. So you can absolutely, on the bare metal side of things, very easily manage the physical network infrastructure. And technically, you can do that just as easily for a virtualized environment, but we don't have the control plane tools or plugins that speak an API or control plane language to something outside of us. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So uh, yeah. the other question is, I guess, is really, I said SDN, I really didn't mean SDN. Um, what, I'm, what about configuring the bare metal switches and the copper rack switches and stuff like that for specific? Yeah, so that's a very good, very good question. Yeah, and we have a lot of customers that ask us about that. Um, we have done some of that work in our digital rebar provision, uh, our digital rebar version two product. And we have some know-how on how to do that. We have not implemented that in version three today. Um, we have customers that have been asking us about that and it is a strong interest. The problem that we keep running into is the reality of most companies is operations and network shall never meet and they're always butting heads and fighting, right? And so I am a network engineer. You will not touch my switch, damn it. Get the hell away from my equipment. And I will configure VLANs and trunks and whatever you need. And so that, that is sort of dynamic has sort of been uh, holding us back. At the end of the day, Rackin is a very small company. You're looking at 33% uh, of the company right now between Steven and I. So, so there's, 
there's six of us in the company and we have to choose our battles very wisely. We would love to be able to provide um, uh, integrated network uh, uh, capabilities, um, but today we just don't have a customer paying us to do it. At the end of the day, nobody's paid us to do it, so we haven't done it. Um, right. We do have architecture in mind and we do have tools that we know in ways that we know how we're gonna do it. Um, we just haven't done that integration. But at the end of the day, if we have a customer that's um, relatively go-getter-ish, smart enough, capable enough, we have the tools here to enable um, that ability. And that goes back to this workflow uh, where you can define, um, and actually, so workflow is just, um, oh, I do have multiple workflows. So um, workflow is information, uh, metadata information is held as a, a profile. And a profile simply has a parameter that defines the uh, stage map that is the workflow implementation. And so um, globally is applies to every machine in my environment. Typically you're not gonna have a global workflow that looks like this because you're gonna have more than just an Ubuntu install probably of one type. Uh, you could, if you have a small enough environment, have one workflow that's global, every machine that's provisioned gets this. But we might realistically have multiple workflow elements. And in this case, this is a two part workflow that says, um, discover my machine and then put my machine into sledgehammer await. That's a special state, which is our sledgehammer image in RAM live boot image that just stops and waits and says, okay, I'm done. I'm ready. Do what now? So then what I would do is I would tell the machine now, okay, start a CentOS 7 install, um, start the runner service. The runner service is what implements our workflow on the end uh, machine. Uh, and this is a broken workflow. There should not be a finished install here. So this is not a valid workflow, but let's ignore that for the moment, okay? Um, it, we can literally just remove step and we get sort of a broken state, but CentOS 7 runner service, then we would actually have uh, Docker install. And uh, we, in this case, we install basic Docker and then we do our crib install. Crib install is our Kubernetes uh, rebar immutable bootstrap stage and it does the node enrollment and node admission management to dynamically bring up an, uh, a Kubernetes cluster on n number of machines and it handles all the authentication credentials to bring the cluster up and then complete and success. But at any one of these points you can inject a new stage where you could say um, I want to do uh, mount local disk and I want to, from mount local disk, go to finish install and success, and I add this step, and now you see it pops up here. Now again, ignore the fact that this is a invalid state uh, workflow, but it allows you to see how quickly you can dynamically compose stages to do interesting things. And some of those stages might be things like um, reach out to my network switch, determine what port I'm on, and now um, go to my infrastructure's code, configuration management database, my asset management database, my, whatever you're running, and say, determine based on my role what VLANs I should be in, add those VLANs to the trunk ports on the switch, now bring my OS provisioning instance up with those matching trunk, trunk ports on my bond, and now we can be off to the races and running. Or we might also do an integration step there where we go to our IPAM and we ask our IP address management system, what's my IP address supposed to be for these pieces? So hopefully you can see where that workflow gives you the ability to create customized and dynamic um, provisioning activities that going way back three or four years ago when we started the presentation, when I said, we give you the ability to define how much you want to do and where to stop or how deep into the rabbit hole you want to go. And th this is the piece that lets you do that sort of thing, uh, be flexible and compose uh, so contents Shane, to do that. Any other questions, Shane? I think, we may, I think we're going to stop. We uh, keep we're coming and going. <laughs> it's, uh, any other questions? I've or? got nothing else. So if you want to spend more time, you go out to rebar.digital, you can get all this stuff. Um, even I'm in the process of trying to get this to come up. So 
cool. somewhere in the middle of this chaos. I haven't bothered Shane yet about it, but uh, he's busy. That's what he he was my. But, yeah, um, and we we do have. Um, <laughs> now they're writing me checks right now, oh, right. so I have my own funds. But Shane. Yeah, and there's all the community resources. And yeah, we, we do have an, uh, the uh, quick start guide, which is hopefully tr uh, truly a quick start guide that just walks you through sort of getting it up and running quickly so you can get it into a play state. Um, so please check that out. That's linked to from our uh, rebar.digital website. Uh, documentation links or I rarely ever, here we go. The name, uh, his name is Claudia. Claudia. Cloud. Cloud. Claudia. So, yeah, uh, there's Claudia, the digital rebear. Rebear. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> well, Shane, thank you, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is it's it's a lot. It's one of these simple, complicated things, and it, it's so simple. But then you see all the things you can do and the flexibility, and suddenly, for me, it looks complicated, but. I don't know, maybe you guys look at this and it's like, oh yeah, that's yeah. simple, it's just a sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Right. Hey, Shane, no, that's good, yeah. Shane, thanks again. You know, good, enjoy your flight tomorrow morning. And please, you don't oh, have yeah. to go too far. And uh, I'll talk <laughs> to you. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Bye. guys. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me on.